This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, if you would turn your attention to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, beginning with verse 24 through verse 27, reading from the New Living Translation, there you'll find these words. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. And he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. I'm speaking today from the subject, worth the pain, worth the pain, worth the pain. Have you ever gone through something that was painful, that was challenging, that gave you trouble sleeping and focusing and, and sometimes you had to have external help to help you to get through it? But once you got on the other side of it, you could look back and say, Lord, like Maya Angelou, I wouldn't take nothing from a journey because you realize that it was the trouble and the adversity on your journey that built the muscles to be able to sustain you in the high place where God brings you. It was what you went through that actually made you you. Uh, it's, it's painful stuff that you go through that teaches you how to pray. It's the painful stuff that you have to go through that gives you a compassion for other people. You see, if you never struggle, you wouldn't have compassion on struggling people. If you always had money, you wouldn't know how to, to sympathize with people that are struggling to pay their bills. So you don't ever know why God lets you go through what you go through. But when you get on the other side of it, there is a glory, there is a reward, there is a looking back and to saying it was worth the pain. What makes it so painful is because you don't know how long the light is going to last. You don't know how long the pain is going to last, how long the discomfort is going to last, how long the struggling to pay your bills is going to last, how long living from hand to mouth is going to last. You don't know how long you got to sleep in your car and try to find a place to stay here and to help you with your children. You just don't know how long it's going to take. So once you get on the other side of it and you'll look back and realize that though I had to struggle during those years, it was the thing that really brought me close to God. It was the thing that taught me to trust in him. As a songwriter said that if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. And I wouldn't know what faith in his word could do. But it is going through the challenges. It is enduring the pain. And there are times that God will not deliver you from painful situations, but he will mature you through them. And this is why he's, uh, Paul writing to Timothy, he says, Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. When he tells you to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, it means that your road is going to be hard and he's not going to take you off of the hard road. He's going to build you for strength in the road. Uh, when, when, you, when you get to a place and it looks like life has gotten easy, it's not that life got easy, it's that you got stronger. Because people used to be able to say stuff to you and hurt your feelings and send you back to your room crying. But after you cried a whole lot over a lot of different stuff, it's not that they start saying nice things to you. It's just that you matured to the degree that you got a strength in your soul that what used to hurt me doesn't bother me anymore because I've heard worse than that. I've lived through worse than that. I've had to overcome worse than that. I've been through hell and high water and I'm still here. 
I've been molested and I'm still here. Have you ever had a situation where you went through something that was painful to you and came through on the other side and you said, I wouldn't have wished that on anybody, but I thank God for everything that I went through because it made me who I am today. It made me who I am. It's amazing, and this is the way that Moses didn't give any apologies nor excuses for his journey. But he, he, he rather, he chose, he chose, he chose to suffer uh, the affliction with the people of, of, his, of his race, of his affiliation, of his birth uh, order. He chose that. He could have remained in the identity of being Pharaoh's daughter, but he wasn't really Pharaoh's daughter. You see, Moses didn't have it twisted. That's not how he was made. That's how he was raised. Pharaoh's daughter raised him, but she didn't make him. And, and you got to always go back further than how you were raised and go back to Father God to how you were made. We were fearfully made. We were wonderfully made. We were made in the image of God. We were made for purpose. We were made for destiny. We were made to be able to make a difference in the world. You were made to help somebody else on this journey. It's not that you were just raised to be the, the son of a princess. And so he, he, he wouldn't allow himself just to be identified as Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, he realized, I'm Hebrew. No, 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 I'm, I'm that despised bunch. I'm with the folks that you all call slaves, the underdogs. That's who I am, but I, I make no apologies about it. That's my real identity. And he chose, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He, he made a, a, a decision that I'm going to suffer with the people that's suffering so I can be a deliverer. Because if you don't feel what people feel, you can't heal what they feel. Uh, if, if you cannot feel my pain, you cannot write the prescription for my cure. Uh, and, and deliverance at the end of the day, must always come from within. Nobody can deliver you if you're not ready to be delivered. I don't care how much money that you give. You can't give enough money to a person to deliver them of a, of a poverty mentality. Until the light turns on in them. It, the, the more money you give them, the more they're waste. Until the light turns on on the inside, deliverance is always an inside job. That's why the Holy Spirit comes in us and sets us free. You have to realize it's an e internal work that then shows itself on the outside. It's always, deliverance must always come from the inside. That's why if, if black folks were going to be delivered in America, he had to raise up Martin Luther King Jr. It couldn't come from an outsider. It had to come from somebody on the inside. If it was going to happen in South Africa, it had to happen through Nelson Mandela. It couldn't happen from an outsider. It had to come from some. Deliverance always comes from the. It's an inside job. That's why he's Christ in you. The hope of glory. Because deliverance is always an inside job. You can't wait on somebody to come and let you out of something. That you got to be set free from within. Him that the son sets free. On the inside is free in. Indeed, it's set for real, you see, so it has to come from the inside. And so Moses realized, I'm one of you. And that's why Jesus, if he was going to set mankind free, he couldn't do it as a God sitting up in heaven, as a part of the Godhead. He had to come down and slip into an earth suit and come as a Jew to deliver the Jews. You can't deliver from the outside. you got to always... Come into it. It's just like Christianity. You can't understand Christianity from the outside looking in, taking an investigative look at it as though you're a scientist, putting it to the test. Christianity is a religion that you've got to get all of the way in and shut the door and then the light will come on. You got to get all of the way in it. You cannot understand Christianity from a cursory outside look. 
at, in investigating how people behave. You got to get there and open your heart and have Jesus to come on the inside of you. You got to be washed by his blood. Depend upon him. Take up your cross daily and follow him before the light really turns on. And then you'll understand why people run while nobody is chasing them. Why they lift a hand while nobody made them put their hands up. While a, a quickening comes in their spirit where nobody stuck them with anything. I mean, it's an inside thing that you got to experience Christianity from the inside, the inside. The inside. And you'll realize that it's worth the pain. Because there's a cost of discipleship. There's a cost of, there's a cost, there's a cost. There is a price to pay. Salvation is free, but discipleship costs. It costs you to be a disciple. It'll pay you everything that he's got, but it'll cost you everything you've got. So you got to give him your all. He is, he must be Lord of all or not Lord at all. It's not an either or. You have to give it God everything that you've got. So here Moses, he was much more interested in God's purpose than man's position. Because God's purpose and plan will always take you further than man's plaudits and positions. Man can only do so much for you. So stop skinning and grinning trying to get in the face of human beings and finagling. Because whatever you do to compromise to try to get the position, you got to compromise to keep. And if you sleep with somebody to get to the top, you got to keep on sleeping. I mean, you got to pay your rent some kind of way. And whenever, don't, don't think you can keep on getting money from sugar daddy without giving daddy some sugar. <laughs> Whatever you do to obtain, you got to keep on doing it in order to maintain. So Moses said, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, 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 no. I'm going to submit to God's purpose. And that's why he chose. He made an, a decision with an act of his own will. He chose to suffer. Every person who goes in business, you choose to suffer the ridicule of people. You choose to take a risk. You choose to, to, to deal with some things by putting yourself out there. You choose to become liable in lawsuits. You choose to be criticized for things that other people don't understand. You're making a choice. You're making a choice. Moses made a choice. He made a choice. And it reminds me that one of the greatest sins of modern Christianity is the pursuit of the comfortable Christian life. Sometimes people just want to get a good job so they can be comfortable. Just comfortable, just comfortable. But may I remind you, the Bible says in Amos chapter 6 and verse 1, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. He, he says, it's a dangerous thing. He said, well, 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 beware, take, watch out there. But anybody who's in the comfort zone, he says, woe to them, woe to them. Warning them that they have become complacent. Those who have found their security in what they have instead of who they have. He says, woe to them who are at ease in Zion. Zion is a picture of the church. So he says, woe to them that get in church and get comfortable. Woe to them that start resting on the laurels of what they did years ago. Woe, 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 woe to them that are at ease in Zion. You can't ever assume that you don't need to pray anymore. Men ought always to pray. When he said that, he's talking about mankind. Mankind, men and women, ought always to pray and not to faint, not to give up or lose heart. Always to pray. But Moses kept on going. You know why? Because he kept his eye on the one who is invisible. How do you keep your eye on the one who is invisible? Now, if you can't see him, how do you keep your eye on him? You may not be able to see him, but you see what he's doing. You look back in your life and you say, you know what? God had his hands on me here. God had his hands on me there. God directed me to my spouse. God is the one that got me into this house. God is the one that promoted me on this job. God is the one. I, I see, God, that that was your hand. God, you are the one that delivered me from the fool that I was in relationship with. 
realize that it was God that got you out. There's some people that are stone crazy. They are crazy. And you read in the paper about somebody else whose throat they slit and you used to date him. <laughs> and you realize it was God. It was God. God, I see your hand. I couldn't see you, but I see your handiwork in my life. I see you, Lord. I, I, I see you. I, he kept his eye on the one who is invisible. You may not be able to see God, but you can see him working all through your life. You can see that God was directing your steps. I, Lord, I can't see you, but I see your hand guiding me, Lord. I see your hand keeping me. I see your hand strengthening me. I, I see you, Lord. I see you, and yet I don't see you, but I see your works. I see where you're moving. I see your, your protection over my life. I see you. I see you, God. I see you. God's got his eye on you and you've got your eye on him. And that's the only thing that gives you staying power is that keep, you keep your eye on him. That gives you staying power. And so Moses kept his eye on the one who is invisible. And see, here's the problem. This is why God said uh, to them in the Old Testament, be not at ease in Zion. Don't be at ease. Don't, don't be in the comfort zone. The comfort zone is a, it's, it's a terrible place. You, you, you die in the comfort zone, a slow death. Here's the problem with comfortable people. Comfortable people don't grow. Comfortable people don't change. Comfortable people, they don't dream or plan. Comfortable people don't risk. And comfortable people don't explore. Just think about that. When you get too comfortable, comfortable people, they just don't want, they don't want to, they don't want anybody to rock the boat. They don't grow, they don't change, they don't dream or plan, they don't risk, they don't explore, they're scared to go out the country. Because whenever you go to new territory, you have to make yourself uncomfortable. Because you don't know what to expect and how to expect it. Comfortable people don't grow, they don't change, they want everything the same. And anytime that you rearrange the furniture or put the dishes in a different cabinet, they get frustrated. Because they don't like to grow, they don't like change, they don't like to dream, they don't like to plan, they don't like to risk, they don't like to explore anything. Comfortable folks like things to stay the same way that they are. Yeah. It's the way it's always been. <laughs> Go over there and give me the yellow pages. And you can get left behind and lost in a comfort zone. That's why you have to, you have to stay open. You have to keep yourself uncomfortable. Uh, I was in China last month and, and it was interesting uh, uh, being there uh, that uh, I, I noticed they don't eat as much as we eat. I, I went to breakfast one morning and I, I ordered a Belgian waffle. They gave me a fourth of a waffle. I said, I, I didn't order off the children's menu. <laughs> I want a whole waffle. I, I never had anybody bring me a fourth of a waffle before. I said, no wonder you all are so petite. I said, I'm hungry. I'm from America. Where is the food? A fourth of a Belgian waffle. I, I'm like, I'm a grown and I needed somebody to give me an expletive. I'm a grown man. I was in pain. <laughs> so I knew how to order the next day. I said, I'd like four bedroom waffles. <laughs> I mean, it was an all you could eat buffet. For I had to specify because to them, a quarter was a Belgium waffle. A quarter, but I wanted the whole thing, I felt shortchanged. And that created great consternation and pain on the inside of me. But don't be afraid to take a risk. Don't be afraid to take a risk. You know why? Because failure does not define you, it prepares you. Failure does not define you, it prepares you. Your failure, everything that you fail that prepared you for your next success. Every failure has in it preparation power for your next success. 
You, you, as you fail, you learn something that further prepares you for your next success. And so failure is painful, but I encourage you to choose your pain because some of your pain is the result of your own choices. I mean, as much as you want to blame the devil, I know the devil. And, uh, you know, the story is told the devil was sitting out on the front steps of the church just crying. And God said, Satan, what's, what's the matter? And he said, all those people in the church keep on blaming me for stuff I didn't do. <laughs> See, here's the key in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 3. Get your phones out and take a screenshot of this. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. Do you know that's in the Bible? Take a screenshot of that. Send it to people that you know. Just say that I saw this in church. Just, just take a picture of that. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then they are angry at the Lord. Lord, why are you let me marry this fool? <laughs> Jesus, why did you let me get pregnant? People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then they're angry at the Lord. It's in the Bible. Touch somebody, tell them it's in the book. It's in the book. It's in the book. <laughs> They can't act as though you ought that these words, it was that these words were penned before you were born. It's in the book. It's in the book. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then they're angry at the Lord. So some of your pain comes from as a result of your own choices. And we have to accept responsibility for what's our own things. And listen, here's, here's the danger of not accepting the responsibility. If you don't accept the responsibility of it, you can't get it off of you. See, if you don't own it, you can't disown it. So you have to say, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's me. Yep, yep, I was stupid, I was immature. You have to accept it so you can disown it. If you don't own it, you cannot disown it. You can't disown something. You know, when a, you've heard of parents disowning their children. You can't disown your children if you never own them. You know, you have to say, no, no, this is my son or this was my son, but no, no more. You're out of this family. It, you, you can't disown until you have first owned. You can't dispossess unless you have first possessed. So that's why with your sin, you have to confess your sin. You have to own it because if you don't own it, you cannot disown it. And that's all that is talking about accepting your responsibility. God cannot cleanse us of sin that we say that we don't have. So we have to say, Lord, it's me. I'm standing in the need of it. So some of our pain is a result of our own choices. And then some of our pain is a re result of other people who are connected to your life. Their reflection. Your reflection of whom you associate with. Uh, notice another scripture. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Now notice. If you want to be wise, walk with somebody who's already wise. If you want to be destroyed, keep on partying with a fool. But I say that, you, you have, see, life is about balance. You know, because sometimes really, really wise people are boring. You don't laugh as much with a wise person as you do with a fool. So you need to always keep your fool in your back pocket, you know. You know that friend that you call because they're going to be crazy. They, you know, sometimes you just stress and you just need somebody to take the pressure off. Somebody who's just crazy. You, you need, to, you all know that person. I mean, they are, they're a fun person. And I don't mean, I don't mean fool in the, in the, you know, the kind of, you know, this in danger of hellfire. I don't, I don't, this is the, this is the fun person that just doesn't take life seriously. They just help you to laugh about whatever, you know, it's like. You know, you, 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 you're all broken up over, over losing somebody, you know, and you, you, you call the fool and you know, they, they said, girl, who you fooling? He wasn't no good anyway. <laughs> you, you are trying to cry and they're, they're making you laugh. Everybody needs somebody when you're going through pain that will make you laugh, that will make you laugh. You need to 
always have a fool in your life. But you keep them at a certain distance now. You see, you don't bring them in when you need to make very important decisions. That's not the time to call and consult the fool. <laughs> you know, you don't come into money and then call the fool. No, 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 no. <laughs> because a fool and his money are soon part. They, they, they don't, you know, money doesn't stay with fools very long at all. It's like their palms just stay greased. As soon as money hits it, it just skids off. <laughs> But they're going to have a good time. They're going to have a good time, man. Let me hold $20. <laughs> man, you know. You're going to have a good time, though. You all going to have a good time. You know, you give them that $20 because you're going to have a good time. You're going to have a good time. But always keep a wise person. Always keep a wise person in you. Because here's what you have to realize. Is that your closest friends shape your values. They shape your direction. And they shape ultimately your life. The, the relationships that are closer to you, they, they shape your values. They shape your direction and they shape your life. Whenever you see somebody, if you, if you start dating somebody and your life starts going down, that's a bad sign about that latest relationship that came into your life. I mean, if the direction of your life takes a turn for the worse, run for the hills. You might need to change your identity, go to another, move to another city and state. And everything, get out of town. If you realize that after you, a certain person came into your life, your life started going downhill because your closest friends will shape your values, your direction, and ultimately your life. In other words, whom you choose to walk with determines uh, the, what you experience in life. Whoever you choose to walk with, it, it determines what you will experience. So, Choose your pain. Choose your pain because there's a pain of discipline and there's a pain of regret. There's a pain of discipline and there's a pain of regret. Choose your pain. Choose your pain. Choose your pain. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. If you discipline yourself ahead of time, you know, it's better to, you know, to pay now and play later than it is to play now and, and then try to pay later because you can't pay the interest. And so when you learn, you make better choices. You really do. But there is a pain of discipline and then there's a pain of regret. When, when, you, when you eat the right thing and exercise, it takes discipline to do that. It's a pain. It's a pain to be disciplined with your diet and exercise. Because you don't always feel like exercising. And the stuff that you're supposed to eat that's really healthy and wholesome, you don't want to eat it. And it's, it takes discipline, the pain of discipline. So, but you'll either deal with the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. After you finish eating it, oh Lord, I shouldn't have eaten that. Pain of regret. Pain of regret. While you're partying in school and then don't graduate on time, pain of regret. Now you got to pay two more semesters of college tuition. And go deeper into debt. Pain of regret. Pain of regret. Pain of regret. Notice uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. I like how the word of God is so real with us. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. Discipline is painful. But Afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. See, the joy comes afterwards. The harvest comes afterwards. But there is a painful discipline. You didn't appreciate the hardness of your daddy or your mama while you were young. You know, those folks, I'm telling you, at the end of the day, them folks that had them hard mamas and hard daddies, get up from there. Get up. You, you, you know, I ain't going to raise no lazy child in my house. Oh, you don't like that while you're growing up, but when you get grown, it has made you a responsible person, and now you'll hear the words of that stern mama or stern daddy coming out of your mouth. It's amazing how you'll be, you'll be channeling your mama's spirit or your daddy's spirit and saying the very, anybody ever know what I'm talking about? You, you know, you, you, you had that, you, you had the folk, they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't fool that they said, make yourself useful. Make yourself useful. You know, my daddy just couldn't stand to see somebody sitting down. I mean, he just, 
So when we heard his car coming home, we'd scramble to our, we'd just turn off the television. We'd take off and start hiding because, I mean, if our friends were over, you know, my dad, he, he just, he'd put you to work and then to, if, you, if your friends were there, he'd put them to work too. You know, and then all of a sudden they had to go home. Not because he sent them home. He's like, if you're going to be over here, you're going to help out. You come in and make yourself at home. Make yourself at home. And then you'll find that when you, when you grow up with, with that strong discipline. You know, my daddy said there's, there's no discipline like the discipline of struggle. No discipline. It, it, it makes you who you are. Those folks had a character built in them when they had to struggle and nobody just gave them anything. But when you had to work hard for everything you've got and climb up what's called the rough side of the mountain. When you start off living from hand to mouth and you got to borrow this and, and use homemade kind of stuff and you can't even pay for printed sign. You got to get a, somebody that, you know, a little jack leg and your letters are going up uphill on the window. And, and you, anybody, you know what I'm talking about. You, you, don't, you don't have time to be dealing with all the professional stuff. You got to do the best you can on the level where you are. You're just trying to get started. So you, and so you start where you are. You use what you got and you do all you can. And that builds a character in you. It builds a discipline in you. And, and you don't regret it. You are thankful for it. It's a pain of a discipline that produces a fruitful harvest if you don't give up on it. It'll pay off. So just mind it and understand that when you're dealing with that in Hebrews 12, 11, that no discipline is enjoyable. While it is happening, it's painful, but Afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. You got to be trained in that, trained in it. So just choose your pain, choose your pain. You know why? Because your choices determine your conduct, your character, and your destiny. Your choices determine your conduct, your character, and your destiny. And so it's amazing. I'm, I'm just always encouraged by the examples that we get in Scripture. The Apostle Paul, as he was dealing with uh, certain issues in the establishment of the early church, because Paul was a Jew, and uh, Paul's ministry was primarily to uh, non-Jewish people, to the Gentiles. So uh, the Gentile world didn't have all of the religious hang-ups and practices like the Jews did. The Jews had all of this stuff about, you know, fasting twice in the weekend. And, you know, they had all of these dietary restrictions and laws about this and circumcision and all of that. And so uh, that whole thing was that if you're going to get saved and, and uh, you know, come through faith through Jesus, you, you, they were saying you got to be circumcised. But circumcision was a Jewish thing. It was not a Gentile thing. And so the question was, can you be saved and, and without being circumcised? That was, that was a great discussion. And, and the, the Apostle Paul addressed it uh, in Galatians chapter 6. And I want you to notice what he said in verse 17. He says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble. Paul said, listen, I'm sick of this. Don't bother me this, with any, this mess anymore. He said, I want to talk about this anymore. He says, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I've been beaten. I've been whipped. I've been thrown in jail. Paul said, I've, I've borne pain on my body and I've got the marks to prove it. I've been through hell and high water. Paul says, I have suffered and I've got marks in my body to prove it. He says, what is important is not that your flesh has been circumcised, but that your heart has been circumcised and that you have been crucified to the world and the world has been crucified to you. So Paul says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything. He said, but circumcision of the heart. He says, you've got to have this thing in your heart. Remember, it's an inside job. It's the inside. God looks on the heart, on the heart, not on your flesh. Not on your flesh. It's amazing. And so the beautiful truth of the matter is, is that pain that you endure today can lead to strength that you can enjoy tomorrow. I mean, the more sweat that is lost in practice the less blood that is lost in battle so you have to lose the sweat while you're in practice it's like being in the gym and while you're pushing weights up and you get sore you get sore the pain that you have in the gym today produces strength that you enjoy tomorrow tomorrow 
So you have to make an investment. You pay now and then you get to enjoy the results of it, the fruits of it that come later. And then I want you to notice in, in Genesis chapter 50, because this is the story of, of Joseph. And, and Joseph had gone through a painful childhood. And he was abused and abandoned. He dealt with abandonment issues. He dealt with rejection issues. This is Joseph. He's dealing with rejection issues. But don't let what you went through become the thing that define you. Let it prepare you. Joseph allowed what he went through to prepare him. Notice what he says in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 50. But now their father was dead and Joseph's brothers became fearful. Why? Because they had abused him when he was younger. And now Joseph will show anger and pay us back for all the wrong that we did to him, they said. Their conscience was killing them. And so they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died. And why did he say your father? He was that daddy too. <laughs> Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you. Now they'd lie and put words in their daddy's mouth trying to save their own hides. Please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you. See, they're trying to purge their, their conscience. For their sin is treating you so cruelly. And their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we the servants of God, of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. And when Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. And then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we're your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. So don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you because I'm not you. I'm not going to treat you like you treated me. I will continue to take care of you and your children. And so he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That means that he didn't define himself by what he went through. It prepared him to be the one that could deliver his whole family. And I'm just telling you, there's some things that you go through in your life. They'll break your heart, but they'll fix your vision. Have you ever gone through something that broke your heart, but it fixed your vision? I mean, you, you, you were so disappointed. You were so broken as a result of that. But after that, the pain of what you went through brought such clarity to you. It, it broke your heart, but it fixed your vision. There are certain things, you know, that a broken heart, it, 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 didn't, it, it sometimes doesn't, didn't give you what you wanted, but it brought clarity of what you didn't want. And it helped you to see what's real and what's valuable, what's important, and what you can do without. So there are times that God will use particular circumstances and situations that will break your heart but fix your vision. Because sometimes we just, we can't see the trees for looking at the forest. And God has to let your heart get broken so he can fix your, your vision. Because vision is ultimately a function of the heart and not of the eyes. Vision is a function of the heart and not of the eyes. Sight is a function of the eyes. Vision is a function of the heart. And that's why when your heart gets broken, it can then fix your vision. Because God helps you to see things that you couldn't see before. Because pain is a wake-up call. When you start having pain in your relationships, it's a wake-up call. You have pain in your marriage, it's a wake-up call. You have pain with your children, it's a wake-up call. You have pain in your finances, it is a shouting, screaming wake-up call. I'm just telling you, pain is a wake-up call. And when you start having pain, pain will teach you what's important. You get in pain, get in pain and see how much you want to go out and party. Deal with chronic pain. I understand what chronic pain is. If you've ever had any issues with your back, I don't know whether you ever, you know, the back has nothing to play with. You ever have something, and, and nerves in your back are like a electrical wiring. It can feel like you've stuck your finger in a socket and, and it can paralyze. You can just make a sudden move. You can sneeze and be in a, uh, have a conniption. 
I mean, you, you, you can be in trouble. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and I'm talking, when I say chronic pain, I don't mean pain that lasts 20 seconds and you can breathe through it, you know, like, and then it's all over. When you deal with back pain, it, you can deal with it not, not seconds and minutes, but days and weeks and months until it wears you down. And I know the look when I've been to the hospital to look at people whose lives have been haggard by pain. Well, they haven't been able to rest well at night and you, you finally have to take medication to help you to sleep. You know you've got serious pain when pain wakes you up out of your sleep or keeps sleep from you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And to be so haggard and worn down and beat down by pain, just pain coming into your life that haggards your body over time. It wears you down and there's a look that comes through the weariness of a person who's gone through the weariness of pain. My question to you is what kind of tired are you? What kind of tired are you? There's a physical tiredness that can be resolved by sleep. But there's another tiredness that comes to the human soul, the human psyche. And sleep will do nothing for it. If you're physically tired, sleep will cure your tiredness. But if it's weariness of your soul, that kind of tiredness can only be resolved by peace. And that's why sometimes when you get away from people that have wearied you in your life, sometimes you just need peace. It's like I've got to get away to have some peace because my soul is tired. And if you don't find rest for your soul, Jesus is the bishop of souls who are weary. And he says, come unto me, all of you that are labor and are heavy laden. He wasn't talking about people that's been in the field and in the factory and in the kitchen all day. He was talking about people who were weary by the circumstances of life and by relationships that have beat you down and devalued you and rejected you and abandoned you and hurt you and abused you. And he says, come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden. He came to bind up the broken hearted. The people whose hearts have just been so damaged severely. And he says, I'm there for you. Because there's a weariness that though you slept last night or didn't sleep, he says, what you really need is peace. Because you're so stressed about money that you owe, that you can't pay back. And you're so stressed about information that is out there and who knows this on you and that on you. And this that you didn't get and that that you didn't get and wondering, can I keep this? And you're stressed, you are worried, you're tired. There's a tiredness to your soul. And you got to fix your eyes on the one who is invisible. If you're going to be able to go through this. Because God's trying to give you a testimony. He is faithful. God is faithful. I don't care how long it's taken. Because when you've been waiting on something a long time, the longevity of time delays can cause discouragement. And your soul can become weary. And this is why he reminds us, be not weary in well-doing. For you shall reap at the appropriate time in the due season. You're carrying a baby and your baby has a divine due date. And while you're in that due date, every woman in her ninth month is ready for that baby to have come yesterday and last week. Every woman. You've been carrying something and you feel the pressure on it. And you're tired, not just physically, you're tired because this thing has worn you down. Carrying this load. You can't sleep at night. You keep trying to shift your position. Trying to find a comfortable position because when you're carrying something, you can't find a comfortable position in the bed. Anybody know what I'm talking about? This thing kicks you in the night. I'm talking about when vision is on the inside. When destiny is calling you. When there's something that is bigger in you than where you are right now and it is causing a holy discontent 
because you're working in a field right here but God has already shown you somewhere in the palace and here you are gifted you're gifted like a Joseph and you're in a jailhouse and your gift is operating in the jailhouse and you wonder God why is it that you've not opened the door for me to be able to share my talents with the king yet but there is a day that God will have the king to send for you keep on operating in your gift keep on operating in your gift I came to tell somebody divinely by the Holy Ghost today that God has your name on the mouth of people right now to be able to bring you into positions of promotion and opportunity in the name of Jesus. I, I, I don't know who this is for today, but I'm prophesying. God has you on the mind. He has you being discussed for opportunities, for promotions, for raises, for unique positions in the name of Jesus. He's got you on somebody's mind. Husband, wife, you think that you're forgotten. I hear God says, I have not forgotten you. He says, I see you. I see you. I see you. And he says, come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden. He says, I see the weariness of your soul because you've been warning, wondering, Lord, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Everybody that I know has gotten blessed, Lord. When is my time? When is my time? When is my time? And there's a weariness that is in your soul. In the name of Jesus, I'm calling for weary folks today. Jesus said, come unto me, all of ye that are laden and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That rest is not a comfortable posturepedic mattress or tempurpedic mattress. This is a rest that comes under your soul, under the emotions and everything that you've been dealing with. This is a supernatural divine thing that only the power of the Holy Ghost can do. This will not come as a rest that comes by Valium. It won't come from alcohol, from any drugs that you can take. This is a rest that comes from a touch of the supernatural, a touch of the divine presence of God in your life. This comes by a word from God that brings the peace of God that passes all understanding and guards your hearts and your minds by Christ Jesus. He just said, come unto me all of you that we're laboring or heavy laden and I give you rest because there's been an unrest in your soul. There's been a weariness, a weariness, a weariness, a weariness. The longevity of time has just nearly worn you down. And you're just wondering, God, how much longer? How much can I endure? I'm only one person. I'm just a human being, God. And I've done everything that you've told me to do, God. I've tried. I've done everything, God. I don't know what else to do now. I'm at my wit's end, God. I've run out of gas. Who am I talking to in this day? I, the Lord hears you. He hears you. He hears you. He sees you. He sees your affliction. And I heard the Lord say that I will answer from heaven. He says, I've got your name. I've got your ideas on the minds of folks. He says, don't think that you have been forgotten. Don't think that you have been forgotten. God says, I see you. I see you. I see you. I've got the reserved timing for you. They will sin for you. Though the vision tarry, wait for it. She crede boskota manskitish. For what is for you is for you. And as your heart is submitted, then every opportunity that has been reserved for you is prepared for you and for you alone. When your heart is submitted to God, nobody can snatch your opportunity. I see the earth right now. I'm having a vision on the inside. Because I see the earth and there have been various things that have been causing pressure, 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 pressure. And I see in the realm of the spirit right now that when you employ the power of praise and worship and prayer, it has the power to pull down the answer from heaven. But if you let what is happening to you frustrate you, 
and depress you. It has suction power that will pull up from hell demonic spirits and influence to attack your life, to wear you down. And you stand on the earth realm and what you do determines whether you summon something down from heaven or pull something up from hell. Choose your pain. The choice is yours. It's yours. It's yours. When you yield to God, when you say, God, I give you everything I've got. I'm tired, God. I've, I've talked all that I know to say. I'm waiting on you, Father. And he just wants to know, can you praise me? Why are you waiting? Why are you, your hands are still empty? Why are you not yet inked the deal? Can you praise me? Can you worship me? Can you honor me? Can you wait upon me? This waiting has weakened you. Because you were waiting on the thing. But when you wait on the king, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew. 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 Renew their strength. Renew their strength. Renew their strength in the name of Jesus. In the name of Yeshua today. In the name. In the name. I speak divine strength. 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 Be strong in the Lord. 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 There's staying power. Staying power. Staying power. Staying power. My God, as you open your mouth and bless the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, you bring down supernatural, sustainable help from heaven. You bring it down. You suppress what is in hell that is trying to attack your mind, attack your emotions, attack your finances in the name of Jesus. As you praise him, God moves on your behalf. He's exalted. He's exalted. He's exalted. We extol you, God. We exalt you. We magnify your name. We declare that thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. All the glory, the honor belongs to you, Lord. You're so worthy. 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 We glorify you. There is none like you. You're beautiful in all of your ways. Far exalted one. We extol you today, oh God. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.